Cool. So let's get into the glycolysis system or the glycolytic system. Um, think if you're thinking glycolytic, what are what are some sports that are glycolytic? Uh, think CrossFit, right? Cloth, CrossFit. <laughs> I just put a weird L in there. Uh, CrossFit is a very glycolytic sport, right? Like it's going to have some phosphagen system. It's going to have some intermediate time frames where it's like six seconds to a couple of minutes, um, like Fran or, or some of those types of workouts. Um, think soccer. Soccer is pretty much a glycolytic activity, even though people like to think it's aerobic. It's it's constant walk, jog, uh, sprint. There's periods of interspersed activity. Other kind of glycolytic sports would be wrestling and a, and a couple minute wrestling match or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, boxing rounds, MMA rounds. Those are, those are more glycolytic sports. So essentially what glycolysis is, is it's kind of like this in-between pathway. So it's somewhere between aerobic and anaerobic. While glycolysis is technically an anaerobic pathway, it's not requiring the use of oxygen for anything. It's serving as a bridge. It's kind of helping us get to where we would need to be for aerobic um, energy systems, for oxidative phosphorylation, for the electron transport chain, for Krebs cycle. It's, it's providing us some of the intermediates that we're going to actually need realistically glycolysis can be broken down into two separate and distinct phases. You're going to have an energy investment phase, which means that you're going to actually be putting ATP in to the pathway. You're going to kind of be putting ATP into the equation with the hope that you're going to get out even more. Think of it like a retirement savings plan. You're putting money in, hoping that at the end uh, with interest, you end up getting more money out. Second phase of glycolysis is going to be the energy generation phase. So that's where all of the fun stuff comes out. That's where you're actually getting ATP out of it. It's where you're getting energy out of it. And you're actually, your investment is paying off. Your 401k is finally paying off in retirement. The net production, net production at the end of glycolysis is two ATP and then either two lactate or two pyruvate. And you also get some NADH in there as well. And we'll go over those a little bit more in, in detail later. Um, one of the things that I want you guys, before I click to the next slide, because some of you guys know what's coming, um, I want you to know that the pathway, learning the pathway for this is super important. I, I want you guys to, to know the, the, the substrates. So I want you to know glucose and glucose 6-phosphate and all that. And then I want you also to know the enzymes and where you get out ATP, where you put in ATP, ATP, where you get out NADH, um, and I want you to know the rate limiting enzyme of phosphofructokinase. It sounds annoying. It sounds like a lot of work. And, and I'm not going to lie to you. It really, truly is. It's, it's a lot of memorization. But the reason I want you to know it is because it plays into everything that we're going to be talking about through electron transport chain and later on in the semester. It's, it sucks, but it's just one of those things that I need you to do now. And I promise you it'll pay off later. Okay. So essentially what glycolysis looks like is it is a series of coupled reactions. And remember, coupled reactions are the combination of endergonic and exergonic reactions. So it's like it's using the ATP generated from one reaction to fuel the next, to fuel the next, to fuel the next, right? Essentially, it's a string of reactions occurring in a simultaneous nature, getting a specific product at the end. I give you guys a couple of slides to really visualize what glycolysis looks like. Um, one slide has these kind of structures, the next slide just has them in a chain, but choose whichever one makes the most sense for you and really try to memorize it using the, the way that makes the most sense for you. Some people are gonna like to see structures, some people are not. For me, I personally like to see structures. It's easier to kind of visualize what's going on and you can, you can almost visualize why the enzymes are doing the things that they are doing. So glycolysis starts with one of two different inputs. You're either going to have an input of pure glucose, C6, H12O6, or you're going to have an input from glycogen. And remember, glycogen is just a string of glucose molecules. So essentially, glycogen is putting in glucose. It's just not coming from foodstuffs, per se. So the first step of glycolysis when you're starting with glucose is going to be the conversion of glucose to glucose 6 Phosphate. So what that means is that we're using the enzyme hexokinase right here to create glucose 6-phosphate. If you remember, kinase means that we're adding or manipulating a phosphate group. So we're adding or removing a phosphate. And here, it's telling you, this enzyme is telling you what phosphate we're adding or where specifically we're adding that phosphate to the structure. 
So it's hexokinase. So hexo or hexa means it's, it's the root word for six. It's like the Latin derivation for six. So it means that we're putting a phosphate onto the sixth carbon. And that's what, that's what occurs, right? So we've got one carbon here, second carbon here, third carbon here, fourth carbon here, fifth carbon here, sixth carbon here. And if you look, we now have a phosphate that was not originally there. So that means that it is termed or named glucose 6-phosphate. So we have a phosphate that's located on the sixth carbon of glucose. Then we go through and we use the enzyme phosphoglucoisomerase or phosphoglucoisomerase to actually take and change the structure of glucose 6-phosphate to a different sugar that is fructose 6-phosphate. So remember, iso isom isomerases change the structure. They're not changing the constituents, but they're changing the way that they're, re they're arranged. So we're, all we're doing is rearranging the carbons here, right? And we're generating fructose 6-phosphate. So we're creating an isomer. We're creating a different structure with the same constituents. So that would be with the enzyme phosphoglucose isomerase. Next, we're going to use phosphofructokinase to create fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So if we're using the same rules from hexokinase, what we're, what we're doing here is we're adding a phosphate to a fructose because we have a kinase, right? Kinase means phosphate. Fructo is the sugar that we're going to be adding the phosphate to. Fructose is going to be the sugar that we're adding the phosphate to. And if you look at the structure, we then have one phosphate and a second phosphate. And it makes sense because we have the sixth carbon has a phosphate. We've got one, two, three, four, five, sixth carbon has a phosphate. And then also, if you notice the name that we just created, the new molecule that we just created is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Bi means two. Phosphate. We've got two phosphates now, and we need to know what carbon they're located on. So if we know that we were already on fructose 6-phosphate and we add another phosphate, where is it going? Well, it actually went to the first carbon. So you can see carbon 1 right here now has a phosphate group attached to it. So it'd be carbon 1 with a phosphate, carbon 2 does not, carbon 3 does not have phosphate, carbon 4 does not have a phosphate, carbon 5 does not have a phosphate. So that means carbon 6 kept the original phosphate. So that's phosphofructokinase creates fructose 1,6-bisphosphate from fructose 6-phosphate. So we're just adding a phosphate to the first carbon, right? Does that make sense? Cool. The next enzymatic step is going to be taking and breaking this, this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into two separate molecules. So if you look at the book, you can see that glycolysis in the energy investment phase is actually a single molecule going through. Kind of at the midpoint of glycolysis, we actually take and we fracture that, and we actually create two mirrored pathways, essentially. So we're, we've taken and we've split a six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules, and we're gonna proceed with two separate independent pathways that are gonna mirror each other with three carbon molecules down each side. So aldolase is going to be the, the enzyme that actually takes and splits fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into two different three carbon molecules each one with a high potential high energy phosphate attached to it. So imagine aldolase is just taking and ripping this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate right in half because that's what it's doing, right? And what we get off of that is we get one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and we get one dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So you can see that the constituents are still the same, one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, and a phosphate, one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, and a phosphate, the difference is the position of the phosphate, right? And the position of the double bond. So they're the same molecule constituent-wise, but their structure is actually different. So what enzyme do we know is going to rearrange structures 
to help us out here. We know it's going to be an isomerase, right? So it's actually going to be the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase that's going to rearrange this carbon molecule, this dihydroxyacetone phosphate, to create a second glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And what I want you guys to really pay attention to is that the name is drive, or the, or the function is driving the name. The form is driving the name. So triose phosphate isomerase. We know that we're trying to rearrange a phosphate because we have to keep that phosphate. And because we know that um, the phosphate is in a different position on each one of these molecules, right? Like here it's attached to the sixth or the bottom carbon. Here it's attached to the first carbon. Triose, tree, three, the root word tri means three. We're going to actually take and move this first phosphate group from the first carbon and put it down on the third carbon, tri, right? Triphosphate. So we're moving it from the first carbon to the third carbon. And what that's going to do is it's going to help us isomerize um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate into a second glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So our net out of this is now we're running run in the sequence with two separate glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates. From here, we're going to continue down and we're going to create a 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate right here. And remember, this is actually occurring in tandem. So we're not just generating one 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, we're actually generating two 1,3-bisphosphoglycerates. Um, this is via the enzyme glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase. So we're, we're kind of just adding in a, a phosphate here. Um, I, to be completely honest with you, I don't know why it's not a kinase because we're using a, we're using a, a kind uh, phosphate here, but it's just kind of the way that it is. It, it's one of those weird oddities. Something that I also want to note is certain textbooks, certain people are going to call 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate something a little bit different. So bis means two, di also means two. Some people you'll hear call 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate 1,3-diphosphoglycerate, and they actually shorten that down to 1,3-DPG pretty often. So from here, we're going to go uh, phosphoglycerate kinase, so we're going to remove that one, that first phosphate here, um, and create an ATP. So that's the first output of energy. That's going to be the first creation of of ATP that we're going to get. And the result, because we pulled that phosphate group off of the one carbon, is going to be three phosphoglycerate. So we still have that phosphate attached to the third carbon, right? We're then going to take and shift that phosphate from the third carbon to the second carbon, and we're going to get a two phosphoglycerate. And that's going to be via phosphoglyceromutase. From here, you can see uh, that we're kind of already down here on step eight, right? We're, we're looking at the conversion or the, the transferring around of phosphate groups from the third carbon to the second carbon. And we're at two phosphoglycerate. It might be easy to visualize this as two separate strings or that we actually have two two phosphoglycerates. Enolase is going to actually pull a water off and we're going to create phosphoenol pyruvate. From here, phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP for short, is going to be converted into pyruvate via the enzyme pyruvate kinase. Okay, With this, because it's a kinase, we know we're dealing with phosphates again, and we, we're going to actually be donating, and cre or we're actually going to be not donating, but creating the next ATP. So because both of these ATP generation steps with phosphoglycerate kinase and with pyruvate kinase are both running in tandem, we're not just creating two ATP, but we're creating two ATP twice, or we're creating a net four, or a total four ATP. If you remember that we put two ATP in at the beginning and we create four ATP, essentially the net output of glycolysis when we're starting with glucose is two ATP after going through all of those different steps.
something that I want to highlight here as well is that there is another way that uh, that glycolysis can go. At the end of pyruvate, we can have the we can have an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. And what LDH does is it actually converts uh, pyruvate into lactate. And while lactate is generally uh, commonly called lactic acid, that's, that's actually a misnomer. Um, it's more accurately described as lactate because the hydrogen ion gets rapidly dissociated. You can read about that in the textbook. Highly recommend it. Um, but because we're kind of tracing pathways, lactate doesn't necessarily play into another direct energy pr production pathway, but pyruvate does. So for now, we're going to end with this generation of pyruvate before we talk about Krebs cycle.